pleased to say the president of Sinn Féin, Mary Lou Macdonald, is here with us in the studio now. Good to see you. Thanks Good for morning, taking the time to join us on the programme. Uh, let's go straight in there. You, st you say United Ireland is now within touching distance. Um, we've heard from Geoffrey Donaldson. He says you must have the longest arms in Ireland. <laughs> what would you say in response? Indeed. Well, first of all, uh, I don't think anybody should be surprised at a unionist advocating a unionist position. I would expect that, and I respect that, by the way. Uh, as your viewers will know, there is an outstanding constitutional question on the island of Ireland. We've been partitioned for more than a century now, but politics, life, expectations have changed right across the country. And as per the Good Friday Agreement, which is now 26 years old, there's a provision for border polls to adjudicate whether A, the union with Britain continues, or whether we reunify, and I'm a united Irelander, we, I firmly and passionately believe that our best opportunities are when we are united economically, socially, politically. Uh, and I think recent elections in the north of Ireland and at the weekend, uh, my colleague Michelle O'Neill becoming for the first time a Sinn Féin first minister in the north are just indicators of a profound change that's happening in Ireland. And when I say unity is within touching distance, I said in historic terms, I don't mean that it's happening next week or next month. So you don't have to have those long arms that Geoffrey refers to. Uh, but what I am saying and what I firmly believe is in this decade, we will have those referendums. And it's my job and the job of people like me who believe in reunification to convince, to win hearts and minds and to convince people of that opportunity. Part of which, Kay, by the way, will be really consolidating our relationship with Britain as our next door neighbour and a good friend. Yeah. What time scale are we talking about? I, I envisage us having the referendums in this decade. So before uh, 2030. Yes, and let me say that is not so far away. So there's an awful lot of work that needs to be done. I've said consistently to the government in Dublin that they really need to take possession of this conversation that's now underway right across Ireland. They need to give it a structure and a place. And of course, it has to be inclusive. We want to hear from every voice including those for whom reunification would not be their first option, those who go out and campaign for the union. Nevertheless, we all live together. That's never going to change. We share Ireland, we love Ireland, uh, and we want what's best for our children, for our grandchildren. I think that's the strongest, most powerful common ground that we all share. So sooner rather than later, because you're somewhat slipping in the polls? Yeah, I mean, today we, have, we haven't had a good poll. There's a lot of polls out and we're up and we're down. I mean, I, I always listen to them. I, I prefer when we're having, you know, when we're up in the polls, but the message from the electorate always needs to be heard and heeded. And what this means is that we will work harder. I mean, that doesn't dim my determination in respect of Irish reuni reunification or indeed in respect of the opportunity for Ireland to have a government of change a government for the first time without Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael, who, as you know, are the two big beasts, traditionally the two big establishment parties. So I think, notwithstanding the poll, it's still very much game on for that. There is a huge amount of work to be done. We have a housing crisis. We have issues in our health service. But we also have huge opportunities in climate, in developing our economy, and I want us to grasp those with both hands. What's your relationship like with Sir Keir Starmer? Do you think that he uh, would uh, take your calls uh, for a border poll more seriously than a uh, Conservative government? Well, look, I, I, I think irrespective of who is in number 10 Downing Street, the rule book is written. You know, it's the Good Friday Agreement, it's referendums, it's a decision by simple majority, 50% plus one, retains Let me just the union or makes the change. So the reason I, I would that. hope that, that Keir Starmer and a Labour government, given that the Good Friday Agreement was a Labour Party achievement in the first instance under Tony Blair, I would hope that he would be very true in word and spirit to, to the Good Friday Agreement. The reason I say that is because Andrea Leadsom, who is a senior member of the Conservative Party, as you know, the government, that, therefore, uh, sat where you are right now and said, not exactly quoting her, but she basically said, over her dead body, would it happen? Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think she quite said that. I no. think I saw the piece. Well, look, I mean, everyone's entitled to their view, but I, I would just remind her and others that the agreement is very clear. Irish people, North and South, will make that call without coercion or impediment. And whereas, of course, people here 
in this country will have a view, in some cases a very passionate view, I, I think they have to concede that at the end of the day, Irish people north and south will make that, will make that call. And it's not... It shouldn't be uh, such a melodramatic over my dead body, not that the woman said that type of moment. We need to understand... It's basically what she meant. Well, po quite possibly, but, I mean, we live now in a global village. Like, we're all very interdependent, and a thriving, united, prosperous Ireland is good for this part, of it. it's good for Europe, and it's good for the world. So yeah. I would appeal to Tories who are, you know, uh, unionist in tooth and claw, fine, that's your view. But just respect our right to make the decision. And just for a moment, suspend your disbelief and see the positive outcomes okay. that can come You, you mentioned a, go a global village. You called for the Israeli ambassador to Ireland to be expelled and for Israel to be referred to the International Criminal Court. Yes. Um, you stand by that, I obviously. I absolutely... Not alone do I stand by it. I am more convinced now than ever. I, I made that call... Uh, some months ago in respect of the ambassador, it is very clear that Netanyahu's government has no interest in international diplomacy, has no regard for our international institutions, up to and including the International Court of Justice. Um, I, the, the absolute imperative now is for a ceasefire, a complete and final ceasefire. Every effort needs to be made to attain that. But let me say this, Kay, for far too long, Israel has been allowed to act with impunity. It didn't start in October. This is a generational injustice that the Palestinian people have endured. And I think we are now at a tipping point. And I hope we are now at a point that even if some of the international leadership is still very blind to justice, mm. that all of us, activists, individuals, families, communities, mothers, fathers, say loudly and clearly, this needs to stop. And that means Israel has to be held to account. OK, final thought before I let you go. Thank you for your fulsome uh, answers, I should say. Um, I want to just ask you quickly about your elder sister, who was born uh, a man, transitioned, I think, in 2021. Um, given that, how did you feel when you heard what Rishi Sunak said yesterday? Well, <clears throat> I arrived in yesterday night and I, I just got a... I, I just caught some of the exchange... You know, I think it's disappointing if anybody in leadership uses an issue um, around a person's identity, their gender identity, their sense of self, to try and score a political point against another. I, I just think that's very unwelcome, because all of us in the, in the cut and thrust of politics, and it can be adversarial, and we have to have fairly thick skins, mm -hmm. and we can't be overly precious about ourselves, but you shouldn't incur damage on others, and particularly when those in the trans community are vulnerable um, and feel very often vulnerable. When our job as, as people is to embrace everybody, uh, to live and let live, and to allow people their space, their dignity and their respect. And I think it was most unfortunate, given that there was a mother... Of, of a young uh, trans woman who, who had been who had lost their life, who, whose life was taken so brutally. I think that added uh, to it. Um, but this isn't a question just of bad manners or etiquette. This is a question of fundamentally respecting human beings and knowing your place. And nobody has the right, actually, in my opinion, to stray or to cross lines like that uh, and to cause any kind of stress or harm um, to people irrespective of their identity, but particularly vulnerable uh, communities. Okay. So that, that is what I, I would say at that. And I would imagine that the Prime Minister, if he's thoughtful, uh, would apologise for that or, or clarify his position. I think that would be very useful. OK, Marilyn MacDonald, it's great to see you. You can talk more than I can. <laughs> That's quite an achievement. Get yeah, it's the Irish life. roots, I it's think. It's the Irish roots. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, yeah. It's sure. nice to see you. Thanks Thank you so much. much. Thanks a lot. Thank Let's you. have a quick look at the papers.